I have so far taken a double prong. Mm -hmm. One is more experiential, uh, you know, to uh, do things. I call mm -hmm. this a performative approach. Yes. It is through doing. And in my study abroad courses, in Peru, as well as my course this spring, I will have this, I do things with the students. Here I will explore what they are open to. Yes. In Peru, we, are in, we, we work with indigenous people, so we accompany them when they do offering to spirits yes. of yes. the field of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I invite my students to do it if they are so moved. I don't right. force them. And I tell them why. I say, yes. you cannot treat it as a knit. Yes. It's a thou, it's alive, it's, we are entangled with it. Mm -hmm. And then the other prong is, of course, totally a head prong, where I use uh, the work, in particular the work of a quantum physicist, uh, Karen Barad, who came to speak oh, yes. here last Karen year. Barad, I she yes, was here. and she's a dear friend and she taught me all this. She, we were colleagues, she was at Mount Holyoke and I was yeah. at Smith. And, uh, you know, an extraordinary piece of work that really opens. It makes a totally rational scientific argument that uh, the world is actually material discursive. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a little bit complicated, uh -huh. but I pace the students through that. So, you know, this double prong approach, uh, it's not easy, yeah. uh, but with the Wesleyan student, they get it. <laughs> so it's interesting. It's both experiential and intellectual. It's breaking down the borders between those things. Exactly. As it breaks down the border between the natural and the human. It's kind of uh, an integrative yep. approach or embedding the, the mind in in everything. Yep. Not only our bodies, yep. but the greater body, the earth body. Yep. Yes. How about you, Barry? Well, yeah, the last thing I would focus on is for people to take some control and uh, an experiential thing and look for community gardens. Mm -hmm. And community gardens and local gardens um, can be extremely effective ways to produce one's own food and develop that relationship that Frederick's talking about. A brilliant example of this is um, in Cuba, what happened, and oh, in yeah. Havana is oh. a place where community gardens behind apartment buildings mm -hmm. and whatnot, exactly. this is taking um, hold throughout the United States and in other parts of the world. And here at Wesleyan, for example, we have an organic farm where now produce um, produced by student farmers or farmer scholars, as we call them, <laughs> is now being served yeah. in our dining hall yeah. so that everybody can partake in the bounty from our own lands right here. It's so interesting because I've, you know, I've talked with some people who are, you know, they're cynical about the possibilities for change. And, you know, they say, well, the community garden stuff was just this, you know, uh, very elitist thing. And, in fact, it's just the opposite. It, not, right. just, it, not just the United States and not just, certainly not on, just in colleges. But all around the world, people are taking control of what they eat. Exactly. And that becomes this experiential as well as intellectual right. um, route to understanding the ways in which other systems are actually poisoning what we eat or depriving exactly. people of food even as yeah. they produce more food. So I'm hoping that, as we learn in this class, more about these major global issues, we will not just feel um, uh, more depressed about how bad things are, but actually find ways where we can act uh, to begin to make a positive difference. That's right. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this conversation today. That's it's great. really a pleasure to talk with you, and uh, good luck with the work at the uh, College of the Environment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, uh, Professor o Ostrom, uh, who uh, worked in political uh, science and, and economics, uh, uh, really made the strong argument that uh, the tragedy of the commons uh, could be uh, avoided when people manage themselves, when people manage themselves and they have mutually agreed upon rules and that they have a, a culture of trust, a culture of trust. And this isn't, you know, this isn't just idealistic uh, pie-in-the-sky stuff. She found real-life examples, whether they're fishermen or, or uh, farmers, uh, she found real-life examples of communities of trust and mutually agreed-upon rules that persisted for centuries. 
And so she studied these real-life examples to, to extract models from them um, uh, and, um, and to, as an alternative to the tragedy of the commons. Now, the reading uh, we gave you this week is from Yochai Benkler. He says, the point is that people more readily followed game norms when they saw these norms as self-imposed. When they saw these norms as self-imposed or freely cho- chosen. Now, the social psychologists have done experiments on this, as have economists. People are more likely to follow rules when they believe that though they've made up those rules <laughs> or when they've um, uh, freely chosen them. Bakula gives the example uh, also of how, um, how, laws, how laws can help shape those norms. So, for example, he, exa- uh, he, he gives us an anecdote of when he first came to New York. He said he was a chain smoker, and uh, he was, um, you know, very annoyed that all these people would, you know, give him this, these dirty looks because he was smoking. And then, over time, New York City passed these laws that you couldn't smoke in, om- in almost every public space. Was uh, smoking was prohibited. And at first, people really, really grumbled and thought this was awful and the nanny state and this and that. Over time, this just becomes the new norm, the new normal. Right, and so that you now think that you have created these spaces, you yourself, not your mayor or not your administration, you yourself have created these spaces where you don't have to breathe in somebody else's smoke, and that becomes a mutually agreed upon uh, norm. You don't need a policeman, you don't need um, a, an authority figure to tell somebody not to light up in your presence. Bankler writes, we do n- we not only accept our reality. We not only accept our reality, but we also seem to trick ourselves into thinking that whatever the reality is, is what we ourselves might have chosen. Isn't that nice? Whatever the reality is, is what we ourselves might have chosen or what the right state of affairs um, should be. In other words, we have a tendency to accept the regulations and then think those are the regulations we give ourselves. So Benkler is interested in how uh, rules can nudge people to more cooperation, and especially when they come to believe, as we tend to, that those rules are ones we would give our we would give ourselves, and perhaps we even think we did give ourselves. One of his favorite examples is Wikipedia, actually, in which um, a self-governing, very complex community uh, that had some basic rules, like a neutral point of view for the articles, but in which people can have extraordinarily civil and long (laughs) discussions about um, details in the entries, but result most of the time in in decent solutions that the community finds acceptable. They regulate themselves. They regulate themselves. So Bankler writes, and a lot of social psychologists have followed him in this regard, the more we practice cooperation, the more we believe in the virtue of being cooperative. Practicing cooperation creates its own form of social good. And one of the things we'll try to do in this class is to have opportunities for cooperation for you out there watching these videos and participating in the discussion boards where you can link up to other Coursera students in this class um, to do joint assignments, to create joint uh, 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 products or games or uh, uh, or political actions, um, and that kind of cooperation, um, practicing cooperation, um, actually will itself make us more cooperative, according to Benkler. Um, he writes, finally, although there is enough evidence to suspect that when it comes to cooperation, practice makes perfect, that by building and engaging cooperative systems, we increase the baseline level of cooperation throughout society. We increase the baseline of cooperative systems uh, of cooperation throughout the society. Cooperation is the way of coping with or even escaping from the tragedy of the commons. So a social good is produced through cooperation. A social good is what we can enjoy cooperatively. A cupcake is something I can enjoy myself. <clears throat> when I finish it, it's gone. If I eat it, you can't have it. I've already eaten it, right? But there are some things we can enjoy together, and the fact that more of us are enjoying those things 
uh, does not um, d- 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 diminish the quality of the thing we enjoy. Uh, it sounds very complicated. It's pretty simple, right? When we listen to a song, if I listen to the song by myself, um, it's fine. I love it. I'm listening to my song. I've got my buds in. I'm listening to the song. But then I say, take my earbuds out I, and I sl- play it for you. I play it for five friends around, and we all enjoy it. Do, does each of us have only a fifth of the, of, the, of the enjoyment? No, not at all. Maybe our enjoyment is actually accentuated because we're enjoying it together. So I'm here with Lewis Hyde. I'm here virtually with Lewis Hyde. Professor Hyde and I were colleagues many years ago in Los Angeles at the Getty Research Institute. Sent him a note when, I, when we were doing this class uh, and asked him to help me out because we are talking about social goods uh, this first week and the idea of the commons. And Lewis was nice enough to take uh, time out of his schedule to chat with me about um, his work on the commons and, and uh, how it's uh, threatened and what we might do about it. So thank you, Lewis Hyde, for, for participating in, in our class here on how to change the world. Glad to be here. Let's get to work. So tell me, what, what is this, from your perspective, what is this idea of the commons? Well, a, a very general definition of a commons is that it's, it's a social regime for managing a collectively owned resource. So often we think of the commons as, as for example, a field in a city or a park, and it could be that. But um, the point of this definition is to say it's not so much the, op- the field itself as it is the rules that govern how people use it. Or a second example, instead of a concrete commons like a field or a, a pasture, might be um, the commons of scientific ideas. And here again, you would have some rules of the road by which scientists uh, treat their ideas mm-hmm. and, uh, and share them in a way useful for conducting science. So, so when I take my, my dog out for a walk to what I think of as the, I don't know, the common area of the town, the idea of the commons is not so much the, the, the grass that I, we, we walk across, but it's the rules of picking up after my dog or you know, don't, don't go in certain places where they've just put down seed or um, don't. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, um, and one reason to stress the rules part of this is that common ownership of this kind is not necessarily um, tragic. There's a famous critique of the commons, which people say, well, listen, if you open up a field to everybody soon, everybody will come and they'll ruin the field. And um, what this misses is the fact that commons traditionally, and this is a category that goes back millennia in probably all societies, commons traditionally have been a place where people collectively figure out how to behave such that the commons will endure and not collapse. Uh, uh-huh. A simple example, in Europe, uh, people would have a common fields where they would allow, have their uh, cows in the summertime. But one rule would be you can't put more cows on the field than you could have in your barn in the winter. That's, that's a stint. It's a limit yes. on the use. And it means that the commons are uh, protected from overuse. And the commons as... Uh, Real property, uh, fields and forests and streams and so forth, it did last for centuries because they were, because um, there was a social set of customs and, and uh, understood rules that governed them. So, so it's not just this thing you can everybody can use that then is under duress or danger, let's say by overpopulation or something else. It's it's by stressing the rules, you're, it's built into the thing everybody can use as the management of it. Yeah. So in a funny way, you could think of the commons, for example, a park in a big city, as the theater in which uh, that community enacts its sense of how to behave with one another. And, um, uh, you know, my own interest in this, well, so they enact their own sense of how to behave with one another. And, th- and that sense is... Around any particular common, there's a bundle of rights, uh, a, a whole set of things that you are allowed to do, and then similarly, uh, things that you're not allowed to do. So the commons is a bundle of rights uh, by which a community manages its collectively owned resources. 
And so, and how did you get uh, interested in this? You you worked on uh, the arts. You've written poetry. You've you've uh, worked on ideas of the gift. How, how did how did you get interested in in this structure of uh, commons and the rules for using these 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 areas or these terrains? Well, so my interest in the commons comes out of the work I did on on gift exchange, and particularly gift exchange and creativity. So to say a bit about that, I mean, classically, uh, there have been cultures and societies where most material property circulated from one person to another, not through purchase and sale, which is how we circulate material goods, but through gift exchange. And um, uh, gift exchange has certain consequences that uh, when you give gifts to people, and particularly when you get them back, it, it begins to form relationships. Right. If they circulate in a wider sphere, it begins to not just form, but articulate how your community is structured. My own interest in this had to do, though, with taking this language of gift exchange, which comes mostly out of uh, anthropology and some social policy and stuff, and applying it to artistic practice and creative practice. The assumption being that um, there are realms of art practice and, and creativity which, which can enter the marketplace and very nice for you if they do, but the, but but the, uh, so this is not about being against the market, but it's saying that um, typically the background economy has to be some kind of gift exchange uh, economy for the thing to thrive. Um, so many kinds of uh, uh, creative practice require sort of low barriers to the circulation of knowledge, uh, such that people can converse with one another, and this brings me then to the idea that you could you could talk about the circulation as being about gifts, but you could also say that it is about treating uh, the material of your art as a common property. So there's a cultural commons as well as an embodied commons. And so my interest in the commons comes out of my interest in gift exchange. So so this these these low barriers for participation or for bringing the work into the uh, the commons uh, have also they've existed for a long time, but I know from your publications in this area that you have, you see that um, more recently, particularly in the United States, that these barriers have been changed, and that the 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 way we can participate in the commons has been or the, has been restructured or refiltered. <laughs> yes, so. Uh Again, now we're looking at cultural commons, and I think of the cultural commons as this vast store of ideas and works of art and inventions that we've inherited from the past and that we still continue to contribute to if we can figure out ways to do it. It's probably always been the case that there's a sort of tension between individual and community, between private property and common property, um, but we see this marked in particular ways in the current period. I would say, so there, there are maybe three or four uh, points to make about uh, the tension that cultural commons are under at the moment. Yes. I mean, the, the broadest point is to say that we are living, I think, in an age of kind of market triumphalism, particularly since the fall of the Soviet Union. You know, one thing that happened in the 1960s was that um, we in the United States felt ourselves in competition with the Soviets. And therefore, in a funny way, we're on good behavior in regard to um, our public presentation of ourselves. And the Soviet critique was always, well, they're just money-grubbing capitalists. That's all they care about. And so we uh, kind of augmented the public presentation of our interest in art and culture. We had a sort of exporting art that Americans made to other countries and so forth. When the Soviet Union fell, that part of our public uh, sense of duty and uh, sense of propaganda maybe fell away. And um, there are many people who now believe, well, clearly the market is the single form by which we ought to organize our social life. And there's been a push to see into what areas the market could go where it hadn't been before. Now I can say more specifically ways that this has encroached upon the cultural commons. Yeah, I mean, because... And for, for here, here we are doing this online course that's going to be beamed for free to tens of thousands of people around the world. 
Um, you know, low barrier to entry. There's some barrier. You need to get on the internet. You need, you know, you, you need a machine. Right. Um, and I think people in internet culture often talk about low barriers to entry. Like I could start a new business. I could start a. Um, I could publish my own poems. I could, you know. I, so on the one hand, there seems to be this energizing of the commons, right? And everybody can blog and put their work out there. And on the other, or some other form. On the other hand, you've described this market triumphalism where when something is um, commercially successful, there is an attempt to immediately limit access to it so as to create greater profits. Is that fair enough? Yeah. And um, again, my own position is not to be against uh, writers making money from their work or artists making money. It's, it's a problem of balance. And um, yes, the internet has fabulously opened up a kind of exchange which uh, has been a surprise and a delight to all of us. This class is, is a good example of something that um, is broadcast uh, as a common property, as it were. Um, the problem has been that, that um, particularly the old, what are called content industries, the film industry, the recording industry, the movie industry, and so forth, which have properties that they own, uh, have had a kind of panic attack yes. around the um, opening up that the that the digital internet, digital copying, and the internet has caused. And you see this particularly in the copyright realm. This is a place where uh, the cultural commons is is threatened, 